good morning. Let us uh, get started. I want to welcome you first to our public forum, the first for the year uh, at ISIS. And the topic we have today is a broad one. It's a, uh, a crystal ball gazing uh, for 2013. There have been a lot of uh, forums like this elsewhere, but we, we have to do one. I think we will do a good one uh, just to lay out some of the likelihood, the prospects for, for the year uh, in different facets. Thai politics, the economy, uh, foreign policy directions. So I have with me a distinguished and rare lineup. I think that uh, we have not had uh, in public engagements uh, this this mix. Uh, Ajahn Jaran Dittabishai from the government side. Uh, he is the uh, advisor to Deputy Prime Minister Surapong To Wichakshai Kun. Uh, he's also uh, a leader of the UDD. Uh, and he says to, to, to introduce him by saying that he used to be a communist as well. Uh, and then, uh, of course, after him we will have Kun Kon Chatika Wanit, who needs no introduction, uh, former finance minister, deputy leader of uh, the Democrat Party of the opposition. Uh, and then uh, I'll come down to Dr. Sapuwut Sai Shua, uh, a leading, most prominent uh, economist, uh, independent, impartial, uh, in Thailand, and he will perhaps uh, give us some sketches and contours of what we might expect for the Thai economy. And then uh, we'll come to foreign policy, uh, regional relations with Kun Kawi, who also needs no introduction. He's a columnist, regional affairs analyst, uh, been focusing on ASEAN, Southeast Asia, Thai foreign policy for more than 30 years. Uh, so let us start. Uh, I want to also do two housekeeping uh, introductions. We first want to thank uh, the FNS, Frederick Nauman Stiftung. I don't know if they're here, but uh, they have given us a, a small grant to, to organize this forum and a series of forums like this. The next one we'll have probably on uh, Thai-Cambodian border, Thai-Cambodian relations uh, next month. And I, I want to thank them uh, immensely. And second, I want to note that there is another seminar in town today that is uh, uh, very instructive, uh, organized by the European Union on the freedom of expression. So uh, we will understand if you leave uh, before a little bit before 11:30, uh, we will finish here by 11:30. Uh, and EU has this conference uh, at the Dusitani Hotel in the afternoon and tomorrow all day. So without further ado, uh, let me go first to Ajahn Jaran Dittabishai. Ajahn Jaran uh, was educated in the, at the Sorbonne. Uh, in, in Paris, and uh, he has many other attributes, but uh, I think that we kind of associate him with uh, you know, the, the Red Shirts, UDD, uh, United Front for Democracy Against Dictatorship. He has an intellectual inclination and a frequent uh, source, uh, an analyst for the foreign uh, policy community, the diplomatic community, and, and even private sector. So. Ajahn Jaran has a PowerPoint. He, he, his French is better than his English, he thinks. Um, but before Ajahn Jaran, I am remiss. Uh, I must introduce my dean, the dean of my faculty, uh, Professor Supashai uh, Yawaprapad, uh, who has uh, graciously given his time here just to provide some opening remarks. Ajahn Jaran, Ajahn Supashai. Professor Supashai first. Excellencies, distinguished guests, and all the participants, uh, I'm here to welcome uh, all of you to this uh, important uh, forum. Thailand's Outlook 2013 Politics, Economy, Borders, and Beyond. Uh, today actually is almost the, the last day of the first month of 2013, so uh, at least. Uh, it is very useful to to see the outlook of this year. Even today may may be almost the end of this this month already, and uh, we are lucky that we have all the distinguished uh, speaker uh, with us today. I myself, uh, I would like would love to to listen to all the speaker, but because. Uh, as a dean, uh, you have to attend so many meetings. So after this, I also have to go to the dean meeting. Uh, 
when when you are dean, sometimes you you will be less academic because you have to do more administrative work. So uh, I know that you 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 cannot wait to hear from uh, Ajahn Charan. So uh, I would like me to thank all the speaker and to welcome all of you and to uh, I wish that you will enjoy uh, this morning very much. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, is it not is it not too late to say uh, Happy New Year to all of you? And I am very glad uh, to be among Excellency Ambassador and distinguished diplomats. Uh, during the last six years, I went around to Europe, to America, just to, uh, just to uh, make uh, international community uh, to, to pay attention and to understand our struggle at the UDD, United uh, Front for, for Democracy Again dictatorship and 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 now seen as a riches and you know I I try very hard to to make international community understand uh, our movement not easy eh? not easy now uh, many Europeans and American still see us as the pro-taxin movement or fight for taxin. Is it not true? Is it not true? So, so, so today I have an opportunity to 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 tell the story about our struggle and. Before I, I, I like uh, analyze about <coughs> political situations this year. I would like to look back to to look back last year, to look back last year. Uh, um, Maybe Kun Kon will not agree with me. If if I if I I say that the uh, Ying Lak government could pass last year rather easy, comfortable, comfortable. You know, after after one month of the Yenan election, uh, both sides, even the lectures, uh, predicted, predicted uh, Ying Lak Kuomin uh, would not be last long, more than six months or one year. <laughs> it's still very few who actually that at least two years. And now, now, I change my mind. Four year, four year. Why? Firstly, uh, Ying Lak government uh, uh, try to conduct all policy promised last year. Even uh, even uh, there were there there were many criticism of uh, policy, but the government could conduct on completely, eh? completely, and and her popularity is still high, is still high, is still high. 
even even the even uh, she was attacked almost every day. Everything she was attacked uh, by the anti-government or by by the by some group, some people. Uh, I met her one time, and I told her that they try to they try to discredit you everything. But one thing they could not they could not they could not discredit you. And she asked me, what Ajahn, what your beauty? The PAD, the yellow, even Kunkon, cannot cannot destroy her beauty. Her beauty. And because of her beauty, she you know, frankly speaking, is it only her? I mean, is it only Jing Lak who, who won the cabinet, who won the party? And now, 18, now 19 months already, 19 months already. Uh, and opposition side, Kun Kon both in the parliament or outside parliament try very hard to to criticize to attack even even to to kick uh, to kick government out or to oust government but not success not success because i think not only because uh, her popularity but thai people Thai people, Thai society uh, had had uh, much much more tolerant, much more tolerant, because they want they want Thailand, they want Thai society. Um, I mean, is it is in peace or calm, not chaos, something like that. And I do not want to. I do not want to 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 focus that. Last year, it ha it never happened in Thai history that that the the former leader, the former lead, the former leader of the government, uh, are charged criminally. Kunapisik, Kunsuthet. You know, I, I am friend with, I am friend with Kunsuthet. Uh, you know, uh, there were several, uh, there were several uh, bloody suppression in Thai history, but this time, this time, that, that the the leader of the government, former former leader of government, uh, were charged, were charged criminally. A little bit about political movement. The richer, the richer is still growing, still growing everywhere, and more idealistic. More, more idealist. The the riches are more idealist, and the yellow try to recover, and more moralist, moralist. You know, in Thailand now, is it not the contradiction between uh, two two idea, two ideology, but between God and Satan? We are Satan. In the eye of it, in the eye of the, of the yellow, we are Satan. Uh, contradiction between between the good good man and bad man, good man and even and we are seen bad man. So 
you know, only the contradiction or the conflict or the struggle between ideology is very difficult to to solve or to decline. But now, it's you know, it come it come back to to five thousand years ago in Greek or Mahaparata in India, Ramayana in India. That the fighting between between the good, the goodness and the evil. So it's, I think it takes another not maybe another ten year or seventy year to to decline the crisis. Because because we are seen as a as a as a bad man, as a evil. And how to how to deal with the bad man? They are only to kin kin them on, kin them on, or 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 bring them to the temple to be monk. <laughs> so now now the yellow the the yellow become more and more moralist moralist. They present themselves, huh? and and uh, last year, huh? almost every week, people who are who are suffering, or people who have problem, they they randomly they came to the government office. Almost every week, some week every day, <laughs> some week every day, to to demand to demand uh, the solution from government and this year, this year, now, now one month already and it read, it read uh, 11 months. This year, I think that situations Politically, economically, is more or less similar to last year. Uh, I use uh, I, I use the the idea or the perception of Teng Xiaoping. Teng Xiaoping, no peace but no war. May rock, they may sang No peace and no war. It means that. It means that uh, uh, the conflict, the struggle between uh, two, between two, two movement or two camp, go on, thin go on, go on, go on, but we not be like a, we we will not. Be, I mean, I mean that this year there will not be big landry or big demonstration no good data no good data no good data and the government will will try to conduct uh, previous policy or new policy eh? and Jing lack popularity is thin. I mean, constant, is thin content, thin content. And her relationship with the army continue. I mean, good, good, good. Uh, no problem with the army. No problem with the army. So, so don't who don't who call the army to test to test the good data. Should should think, eh? should think or should stop because the army will not test the good data. This year, even next year, no more, no more good data during this year or next year. And and. Uh, Of course, huh? there will be 
there will be uh, there will be pressure pressure from both sides from the riches and from and from the PAD from the yellow or from the Democrat Party the riches get the they, they, they ran away to demand uh, the release of on political prisoner. I, I, I was there, I was there, I was there with them and and I went to, I, I went to speak, but I could not speak uh, in the, I think, one minute or the first minute or two minutes, I could not speak, I cried, I cried, because, because uh, they had been in jail for two years, three years, almost three years, and I, as one of, as one of leader, their leader, could not, could not release them. Our government could not, still could not release them. So, so I feel a shame. I feel a shame, and I suffer. I suffer. This year, the wretches will continue will continue to to demand to demand the government. This is the pressure and the charter chain charter chain. Uh, now now Pur Thai Party and government uh, adopt delay tactic. Delay tactic. So don't don't who want don't don't who want to to use this this issue to attack the government or to out the government will not success <laughs> because the delay tactic, the delay tactic, uh, and and also also the pressure from Pravinia issue. Uh, uh, at, at the first week, first week of this month, uh, the the nationalists they they went to submit submit the letter to the government, the land re, and they 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 uh, went to the border, and I told. I told my friend in the government or in the party that don't worry because is it too early? Too early. Is it like a five five o'clock in the morning? People still still sleep or or they wake up but they too early now. Very calm. Very calm. And I told uh, the dean, the dean of political faculty, that, frankly, uh, frankly speaking, uh, that in Thailand, during the last, during the last 50 years, we never, we never have, we never have the big nationalist movement, never, because because Thai national consciousness is rather low, rather low, not 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 very high, like a Vietnamese or like both Cambodian or Chinese or German. So anyone who want to who want to use the previous issue na, to 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 attack the government, to out the government, win fail, win fail. Huh? Uh, you believe me or not, but you will see. Uh, in October or November, uh, when uh, when the World Court of Justice give give the decision. Uh, I. I I been finished uh, during the last six years. Things things which never happened 
the entire history. It happened easily. And some, some event, not only in Thai history, even in world history, never happened. And I think in next, in next 5,000 years, there will not be happen. The PID besieged or captured the government house for three months. Never happened in world history. The last, the last one, uh, the last 5,000 years and the next 5,000 years will not happen in other country. A group of people, one group of people could capture the government house for three months. Never happened in world history. You know why? I have an article. Uh, if 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 uh, if you are interested, never happened. Huh? And secondly, never happened in in world history. Also, seventy percent of intellectual and middle class agree with poor data. Normally, in other country, the middle class, the intellectual are democratic force. They will not agree with the code data. Of course, maybe some person. But in Thailand, 70% of middle class and intellectual agree with code data. In this country, 90% of professors here agree with code data. Never happened in World History. Not only in Thai City, never happened in World History. Why? Because, because intellectual and middle class, they, they, on way, they are on way afraid of strong government, so they, uh, they were afraid of toxin. They were afraid of toxin, and they hate toxin. So when there is a good data, when there was a good data six years ago, 70% of them agree. So this is, you know, you know, in Thailand, something which never happened will, will happen easily. Will happen easily. But, but I, I, I don't think this, this year there will be something happen easily. No. Uh, maybe next year, not this year. So thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to change tact a little bit uh, after uh, Ajahn Taran's presentation. Um, not going to initially focus on uh, politics. Um, obviously, I'll have to touch upon politics uh, in what I want to say, uh, but I believe we do have some time for discussion afterwards, and uh, maybe then uh, I could respond to uh, some of the points that to run race, which I may not in see entirely eye to eye with. But one thing I will uh, uh, happily agree with uh, Jan Turan in his presentation is that uh, the Yingluck government um, has indeed executed uh, much of uh, its campaign policies. Um, and that's part of the country's troubles. Um, and I'll come to that in, in a minute. Um, but. Broadly speaking, I, I also agree that we're in a period of uh, relative political stability. Um, I fully expect that the Yung government will survive uh, the full term. I thought so, frankly speaking, from the day um, the Puertai party won the general elections. And in fact, the only reason why um, the Puertai party and the Yung government um, might not survive the full term will be entirely up to the path that the government chooses to take on some key uh, issues. Um, Ajahn Jaran is fully aware of that, which is why he was referring to the fact that uh, there won't be any problem for the government because they are delaying um, potentially sensitive issues such as the constitutional amendment. And I think that's good news, um, the best news we've heard today. Um, now, from our perspective, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, where uh, I see the country going um, because of my formal job 
um, as the finance minister, it's going to lean somewhat towards the uh, economic and business side. Um, you're going to hear, I think, a, 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 perhaps a, a slightly different angle um, on prospects for the economy from Dr. Superwood, I, I suppose, after me. Um, but let me give you my take on this. Um, broadly speaking, I think prospects for the country and for the economy is, is excellent. Um, Thailand is really almost in the best position of any country, I, I would almost say, in the world uh, to enjoy uh, good growth in the next 10, 20 years. Um, we are strategically extremely well placed in the region that is expected to be the main engine for growth for the global economy. Um, we have extremely good trading and uh, diplomatic relations with the key economies uh, in Asia, China, India, South Korea, Japan, and so on and so forth. And within ASEAN, which is one of the most dynamic groupings of countries, <coughs> um, we are strategically perhaps and arguably best placed. So uh, from that perspective, I have every reason to be optimistic. And you look at the private sector, and again, um, I've been involved um, in the capital markets before my job in, uh, in politics for almost 20 years, and I've never seen um, our private sector as strong as they are today, um, whether in terms of their balance sheet, whether in terms of the quality of their products, or in terms of their access to markets and, and also to, to um, relatively cheap funding. So from that perspective, um, I think we have every reason to be optimistic. Now, how optimistic? I was giving a, a, a talk um, to the Thai economic uh, journalists um, a week or so ago, and I was uh, extrapolating potential uh, growth for the country, um, looking ahead 20 years, which is what we should be doing. Um, and assuming that we grow at about 5% a year uh, in real terms and have about 3% inflation, we can expect our GDP in value terms um, to be at about 50 trillion baht in about 20 years' time, up from about 11 trillion today. Um, or if you measure it in terms of uh, corporate profits um, and therefore the stock market index today, we're all pretty happy with the market bubbling at about 1,400 on the index. By the way, still below the all-time peak that we saw back in 1994, and Dr. support may confirm this. I think we are the only Asian country that is still trading below where we were um, pre-financial uh, crisis peak. But in any case, uh, 1,400 today, um, we should be able to expect if we handle our prospects correctly, that profits should grow by, let's say, 15% uh, every year for the next 10 years. So we can expect to see the SET index, if we get things right and do everything right, um, and our luck holds, to be trading at about 20,000 um, in about 20 years' time. Now, that would be very good news for a lot of people. Um, now, given all of that, one has to ask the question, you know, if we were to achieve all that, um, where would we be? How would the Thai people be enjoying um, those gains? Well, at the corporate level, um, we would also expect them to make significant gains. I I'm argue that in 20 years' time, um, we should be significant owners of major global brands. Um, by that time, we should be the major automobile manufacturer in the world. There's no reason why Mazda and Honda should be Japanese, but then it should be Thai, um, in the way that the major tuna brands today are all Thai. Bumblebee, Chicken of the Sea, any tuna can you buy anywhere in the world is now Thai-owned. Why not automobiles in the future? Why not Bridgestone? Why not Michelin? Um, in fact, the food manufacturers, why, why don't we own uh, or create um, some of our own global brands, and we should have been able to be successful in doing so within 20 years um, if we succeed in um, reaping the benefits of our potential. But none of that will become will come automatic. And in reflecting uh, on where we are today and asking how 
have we managed to get to today? Um, we have to thank uh, certainly some past policies of previous um, government, I don't mean just the Democrat government, of course, but you know, all previous governments uh, going back 20, 30 years' time. Um, the fact that uh, the agricultural sector is serviced by um, irrigation, by the way, I think barely 20% of uh, agricultural land today um, is irrigated, so there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, the industrial policies of previous governments, um, not least uh, leading to the creation of the Eastern Seaboard uh, was a clear uh, economic policy that has um, enabled us to enjoy economic growth at the level that we do today. Fiscal and monetary policies of previous governments, which means that our fiscal status today um, is very strong, uh, giving the government uh, exceptional elbow room to maneuver as it sees fit. Our monetary policy, the independence of the central bank, uh, which has allowed our international reserves to be rebuilt after the financial crisis to record levels that we see today. Again, all testimony to past policies and past po uh, policy decisions, um, which we are benefiting from. Capital markets, uh, very important. The fact that we have very strong capital market and, and, and banking system uh, is a key backbone uh, to the success of our private sector, and all of that um, is something that we cannot take for granted, especially as we look to some of our uh, neighbors um, and their attempts to catch up with us, whether it's Vietnam or Myanmar. Uh, what they lack compared with Thailand are some key institutions, um, which in many, in many cases we've taken for granted. Well, these are all past good deeds that allow us to enjoy the, the uh, economic fruits um, today. But the environment, regional, global environment is, is changing. Um, new challenges that we face. Um, so we can no longer expect to be able to um, reach our potential based upon just um, the fruits of past policies. Uh, I'm not going to go through in detail what it is that we need today, but clearly a major issue is the um, standards of our education. Um, the level and quality of uh, R&D, I understand the government is trying to ratchet up R&D expenditure so that it represents 1% of uh, GDP. Um, that is good news, um, if well spent. Uh, we need to increase the proportion of the service sector to the economy as a whole. In most developed economies, the service sector increases its share of GDP vis-a-vis um, -vis the manufacturing sector. Um, Thailand, the opposite has been the case over the past several years, and we need to um, we need to see to that. We need to be adding value to coal industries. Um, many manufacturers in many sectors have adapted uh, from just being an OEM manufacturer towards a creator of brands. Uh, we need to continue to do that, particularly in the agricultural sector, um, where we could still add significant value um, to many of our key. Um, agricultural products. We need obviously to improve basic infrastructure, um, especially transport and telecommunications in order to make us more efficient and more competitive. We need to make growth more inclusive. Uh, increasingly, Thailand has been growing wealthier, but the, uh, the spread between the haves and the have-nots have also increased. If we are to be able to continue to grow at 5% a year for the next 20 years without social disruption, then growth must be more inclusive and direct government policies to ensure that growth is more inclusive um, must be taken. We need to also ensure sustainability of the use of our resources. Of course, I mean, uh, including that very much, um, our attitude towards uh, our own environment uh, a country cannot grow for 5% a year for 20 years without uh, potentially significantly impacting uh, upon our natural resources and the environment. And if we are to be able to grow at that pace um, for the next two decades, then we must have clear policies uh, to ensure that our environment is protected. And we need to ensure uh, enhanced and improved um, uh, checks and balances in our system. Um, we cannot be expect to be able to grow 
um, at the level that we we want to see um, without checks and balances being in place. And by that, uh, I mean uh, enhanced roles uh, of, of regulators, whether it be regulators uh, in the economic spheres, such as the energy regulator or the telecommunication regulator, which, frankly speaking, has hitherto been extremely disappointing um, in what they have been able to achieve. But we also uh, re refer to um, enhanced role and independence of, of regulators regulating political activities, whether it be the Anti-Corruption Commission, <clears throat> the Election Commission, and so on and so forth. Uh, plus key economic institutions, such as the Bank of Thailand, which has been the bedrock for, um, for the, uh, uh, the, the strength of the, uh, the Thai economy. Their role, their independence, and their ability to their, do their jobs without political interference um, must continue to be uh, supported. But the key question I think that countries like Thailand um, need to address uh, in assessing the path that it wants to take uh, in grasping the, the opportunities that are available is whether we think that uh, the bulk of the development over the next couple of decades should be done by the state or whether we think that that is the, the essential and basic role of the private sector, i.e. do you as a country uh, support uh, state-led development or private sector-led development? Um, in, in this country, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to, to say uh, what it is that we believe with regards to this particular issue. Um, the picture is clearer in some of the other uh, Asian economies, and I know there's lots of debate on the, the merits of, of either one uh, strategy. But for me, um, I think it's quite clear that the private sector um, is more fleet-footed, uh, private sector is a uh, it's a better, more efficient use of resources. Um, and I very much believe that uh, the way for us to go uh, in order to achieve um, our potential um, is to do whatever we can to help support uh, the growth and development um, and the um, creativity uh, of the private sector. Now, from the state's perspective, that means a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to find ways to uh, enhance and increase the level of participation of the private sector in public investment programs. Now, I believe today, in fact, coincidentally, um, Parliament will, will uh, convene to uh, give final approval um, to the new revised uh, public-private sector law, um, which makes it, will make it easier uh, for the private sector to co-invest uh, in government projects. This is an important um, landmark and uh, will require ongoing government support in order for the law to become effective. We need um, freedom of movement of, of two key uh, factors, uh, not just in ASEAN, um, but I think uh, globally. One, um, greater freedom of movement of labor, um, especially for a country like Thailand that has already um, entered the realm of uh, being one of the aging society countries in the world, in 20 years time, we will be increasingly aging, increasingly old. 25% um, of our population in 20 years time will be aged over 65, which makes us significantly old. Um, so we need to um, have better access um, to uh, fresh labor force and um, free movement of labor, um, I think it's an important step uh, towards retaining our competitiveness. Likewise, freedom of capital movement. Um, I believe that uh, when in doubt, you should at least make sure that there's free and fair competition. Competition is better than uh, regulation in most cases. Um, and. Uh, free competition, fair competition, means freedom of movement of capital. So, because free, because free and fair competition uh, shouldn't be restricted only to local players. Um, international capital should be allowed to participate in uh, key businesses, well, in fact, in all businesses, um, pretty much. 
um, with some uh, perhaps some exceptions um, in 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 the Thai private sector. Um, I have argued for a long time uh, that I see uh, no merit, for example, in our telecommunication sector um, being restricted to uh, just Thai players, especially when we have to purchase most of our technology from abroad in any case. And I do believe that the Thai public, as consumers, stand to benefit uh, from uh, free competition and from uh, direct foreign investment that is not restricted by foreign ownership. So we need to think about some of these controversial issues and make decisions as to whether we are ready to grasp the full opportunities that are open and available um, to the country. We also need to address issues related to um, government policies and by that uh, I obviously mean some policies that I consider to be flawed, but not just me, uh, a lot of people consider to be flawed. When um, I was addressing the economic uh, journalist the other day, um, I was there together with uh, two other ex-finance ministers. Uh, one came from the coup uh, and one was actually a Pua Thai uh, finance minister um, in the first uh, six months of the Yingla uh, regime. Frankly speaking, all three of us sang the same tune. Um, we all felt that current government policy um, was fiscally uh, indisciplined. Um, we were particularly concerned about some key policies, um, for example, the rice mortgage scheme, which is leaking money, destroying our, uh, the, the, the rice trading market, uh, and is prone to huge level of, uh, of corruption. Um, worst of all, uh, the money that is uh, meant to be going to the hands of farmers uh, is not reaching uh, the hands of farmers. Um, and we were all three of us uh, pleading that the government should reconsider its position on, on this particular policy. But there are also other policies um, that need to be reviewed. And in fact, uh, we calculated that if the government was to continue um, with this scheme, uh, this scheme alone over the next five years will cause the national debt to increase by one trillion baht because the scheme is losing 200, uh, 000, 200 billion baht uh, a year um, without fully benefiting the, uh, the, the intended targets, um, which are the poor rice farmers. So the government needs to uh, review its policies as to whether it's consistent with what the country needs to do in order for us to reach our full potential in the next um, couple of decades. More importantly, or just as importantly, the government needs to also take seriously issues regarding fiscal discipline. Now, two days ago, I went to the Constitutional Court uh, because two days ago was the exact one-year anniversary of the um, issuance of the emergency, emergency decree uh, by the Yingluck government giving itself the power to borrow uh, outside of the, of the annual budget an additional 350 billion baht, ostensibly um, because they needed it urgently to invest in flood preventive uh, infrastructure. Well, the truth is that one year on, um, they've only spent 4 billion out of 350 billion and look nowhere near uh, being able to spend uh, any amount of money within the foreseeable future. And by foreseeable future, I mean within the next year. Um, so uh, this went completely against uh, the case that they presented to, to the Constitutional Court a year ago when we filed a petition with the court saying that uh, this is unconstitutional because it's not urgent, it's not emergency, in the sense that there is no way the government will be able to spend the money, um, not least because it doesn't yet, as you all know in this room, even know um, how and what project they're going to be spending that money on. Um, now that is a reflection of, of very poor fiscal discipline. They could easily have access uh, any amount of funds that they need for flood preventive infrastructure through the normal annual budget, easily. And now they're talking already about, um, and Kunjaran was presenting just now, that the government is talking about issuance of a, another law that would allow them 
additional pounds to borrow another two trillion baht to be spent over seven years. Well, that's just pure fantasy. Um, not only is it pure fantasy, it's terrible fiscal discipline because every single baht that they intend to use to invest in projects grouped together to make up the two trillion pack package can be accessed through the annual budget. Each annual budget uh, can, by law, uh, be in deficit to the tune of about 600, 700 billion, which is way in excess of any amount that the government can possibly spend um, in infrastructure uh, over the next several years. Um, why are they borrowing outside of the budget? The answer is simple. There's no transparency. Um, there's no check and balances through normal parliament, parliamentary system. And the government has subsequently made procurement uh, process easier uh, than procurement process required by law under the normal annual budget. So um, you know, I, I get, it's like getting a bee under my bonnet when I start talking about this particular issue. Um, but I see it as a, as a major problem and a major obstacle towards uh, sustainability uh, of our growth over the next several years if the government was to continue um, along, along these lines. Um, we didn't just criticize when the three ex-finance ministers went up on stage to talk. We also suggested that there were um, perhaps some, uh, uh, some amendments um, to laws and regulations that would help ensure uh, that we move towards the next phase of economic development um, in a sustained way. We need to also be addressing key issues related to corruption. Um, one of the reasons why I am so against um, off-budget spending of the kind that this government um, is very good at uh, is because, as I said, there is no transparency. Um, there is talk amongst the private sector that as much as 30 or 35 percent uh, corruption is taking place against the amount of money being spent. Um, we have been declining on the Transparency International Index. We were recently ranked top 13 in the world, just behind Iraq, if I remember correctly, in terms of being the top money uh, laundering uh, country in the world. All these issues need to be addressed if we are to achieve the, the two decades goal um, that I think, as a tie, we have a right to set for ourselves. Potential solution, for example. Um, in the future, uh, the Constitution could be uh, amended or the or the budget law amended, um, which would require that all populist policies be actually financed by, by revenue. Well, that sounds sensible, but that's not what's happening. It's now being financed by debt. Um, if fiscal discipline was to be um, forced upon the government, you can spend money on your tablets, on your God knows what, um, as long as you pay for it with government revenue um, generated that year through taxpayers' money, um, that would by itself um, impose a level of discipline uh, on governments uh, in the future, um, which I think would be positive um, for, for the country. Um, there are other uh, recommendations um, to avoid, for example, corruption. Uh, from now on, why not? state that all state enterprises uh, in their procurement must buy directly from supplier, not through middlemen. Thai International, even today, I believe, uh, is the only na major airline in the world um, that, that buys almost everything through middlemen. Um, we were, when we were trying to address this issue while we were in government, you know, there was a board of director um, who I tasked with addressing this issue. Um, that couldn't help but ask the question uh, of the management in charge. And the question was, uh, do you guys have problems speaking English? Can't you negotiate directly yourself? Why do you need to go through a Thai middleman? And we all know why they go through Thai middlemen. Um, and, and this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of changes are, are, are with political will uh, is not something um, that is, is, should be too difficult. Now, I see uh, Thailand with a golden opportunity because we have never 
had a government um, that has won more seats, more than half the seats in the House through a general election until the Yingla government came along. So this government has uh, a clearer mandate from the people than any other previous government in Thailand democratic history. And it has a responsibility, therefore, um, to push through a reform that could really change the landscape uh, of the country and uh, the modus operandi for the country and allow us to achieve our, games, uh, our aims and goals. And it will be particularly disappointing if uh, at the end of uh, this government's term, we find that we're still at square one. Um, we find that we st we're still at a point whereby uh, key economic reforms um, such as this, which would go a long way towards addressing key issues related to sustainable growth, related to uh, transparency, corruption, reduction, and so on and so forth, have not been made. If these um, reforms have not taken place in these four years, it will be very hard to explain. It will be a, a big um, uh, loss opportunity. So uh, we argue, um, therefore, that instead of pushing for uh, political um, uh, the political uh, amendments, um, especially uh, amendments that, you know, frankly speaking, is so transparent in its attempt to to help uh, the ex-prime minister. Um, the government should instead be using its mandate um, to work for the people um, and to make the reforms that we believe uh, are necessary for us to achieve what is truly uh, achievable for Thailand and its people in 20 years' time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Tuan. Uh, spoken like uh, not just finance minister, but uh, leader of Thailand uh, with your visions. And I think the main point there is that the conditions and mechanics are in place for Thai GDP to sustain a 5% trajectory going forward, even 20 years. So we're very lucky uh, for many reasons that uh, Hong Kong has mentioned, our history, our geography, the resources, the resilience. Uh, but I need to ask you just a short follow-up. Uh, you mentioned that you think that the Yingluck government will last a full term. Yeah? So this year, no problem. Um, I will add something to that. Um, if you go back the past year and a half and look at parliamentary records, you'll see that uh, I may be a little bit off in my data, but the opposition party um, has voted in support of at least about 90% of the legislation uh, that the uh, Yingla government has proposed through parliament. Um, we, anything that we think is, is, is uh, uh, good, basically, for, for the country and the people, we support. Um, the PPP law that I mentioned was something that we uh, wholeheartedly um, support when the um, government proposed through parliament. Um, we play by the rules, and as long as the government um, play by the rules, we don't see why there should be any problem for the government. Um, and included in playing by the rules is respecting the uh, judicial process, um, and not uh, trying to use the executive power and parliamentary majority to override the judicial process. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to listen to all the distinguished speakers. Um, I guess my thinking is a little bit more mundane than uh, Se Kun Khan. I cannot forecast 20 years, uh, but I do hope he's right because then we'll all be very happy, I, I would argue. Um, in regards to Thailand's economic picture, let, let me simply summarize our view as follows. We think that the first half will look good because of the momentum uh, following from the populist policies. Um, the uh, first car program, as you know, um, had 1.2 million participants, and only 500,000 of the cars have been delivered. So you have another 700,000 cars to be produced, to be delivered, and therefore people will to be spending money on uh, all the way to the middle of the year. Um, the rice program, as you know, also has been pushing up uh, agricultural prices, and in the short term, it provides that momentum. Unfortunately, my argument, my thinking is that the fiscal impulse that will come through uh, will peak 
and start to peter off by the middle of the year. And unless the government do does something else, the economy actually slows down. Now, um, ideally, what you'd want to see in the second half are two things. Number one, a recovery of exports, and number two, uh, investment in the infrastructure projects that the government had talked about. And both, uh, I would argue, are uh, much better ways of sustaining growth going forward. Let me address exports first. Uh, if you recall, data from last year showed that export growth in dollar terms was only 3%, 3.1%. Now, that was a far cry from what Kunkitirat had thought that export would grow 15% in dollar terms. Right? Why should it have grown 15% last year? Because we had a flood in 2011, which pretty, pretty much took out about 8 to 10 percent of export growth in that year. So you should have get a payback. You did not. So export growth has been fairly um, subdued, if, if flat, if not flat. You need export to grow this year to take the momentum of the economy going into the second half. That, of course, depends a lot on what happens to the U.S., to Europe, to Japan, and other countries. We're all hopeful that that happens that Europe uh, emerges from recession in the second half, that the U.S. grows 2.5% or so in the second half, that Japan, the Abenomics works, and then Japan also recovers strongly in the second half. Uh, of course, Ch China looks good also. It looks like it will continue to grow at about 8% rate or so. Those are the things that will be key because, as you know, export is still 70% of GDP. Second point on the infrastructure um, investment. Obviously, Thailand has talked a lot about um, major projects since 2005, and we have not delivered. And of course, implementation risk conti continues to be the biggest um, concern of investors. However, if you look at the, um, the plan, at least the plan uh, that I have heard from uh, uh, Kun Chat Cha, the transportation minister, he does seem to have his facts and figures together. He does seem to uh, be pushing the agenda hard. And in fact, things are happening on the ground. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just um, mention a few things that um, that uh, just supposedly is important uh, in terms of the transportation infrastructure project. Uh, the government seems to have refined their thinking on the 2.27 uh, trillion uh, uh, budget. They trimmed it down apparently to two two trillion, and that two trillion of that two trillion more than three quarters will be devoted to rail. And the reason it will be devoted to rail is simply this. There are 200,000 kilometers of roads in the country, but less than 4,000 kilometers of railroad. We're, we're totally underutilizing uh, our rail potential. Um, Thailand ranks 57th on railway. We rank 28th for airports, for example, and we are ranked 36th for roads. We are overusing roads, and as a result, our logistics costs are too high at about 15.2% of GDP. Right. Um, the figure that the Minister of Transportation has, um, they estimate that the road is the most expensive form of transportation, estimated at 1.72 baht per ton per kilometer. If we shift to rail, the cost would be 0.93 baht per ton per kilometer. You half your cost of um, uh, transportation. And therefore, you reduce your imports of, um, of oil. Therefore, you reduce actually accidents on the road because you know road is less safe um, and, of course, less polluted as well. So I guess on this count, the government is on the right track. And ob obviously, on the rail, there are two components. Number one is the uh, high-speed rail. Uh, of course, the government says that they will have a TOR out for bidding by September. Let's hope they stick to that plan. The other part is, of course, the um, <coughs> subway system through uh, throughout Bangkok. Um, actually, that, as you know, is happening on the ground. That's why we have such bad traffic, right? Um, as you know, at the moment, we have about, um, about um, 80 kilometers of uh, subway track. Um, and the government hopes to 
increase that by another 400 kilometers. Actually, that's happening on uh, as we speak, and by another five, six years, we will probably get two, two thirds, if not three quarters of that 400 kilometers built. So these things are happening on the ground, and I think they are um, important, and they are um, uh, good uh, investment on the part of the government. Let's hope that that can start relatively quickly, um, and that it can be sustained. <coughs> the government's uh, projections are quite optimistic. The government had hoped that these infrastructure projects um, will, re will enable the government to invest something like $10 billion per year starting next year into 2015 and 2016. That amount of money is worth about 2.5% of GDP. So if the government can provide a fiscal boost equal to 2.5% of GDP per year for the next three years, then the ability to sustain growth of 5% in real terms is quite easy, quite realistic. And hopefully that happens. Now, whether it happens or not, we ask the minister, OK, what would make this thing not happen? Uh, three things. Number one. I think he was concerned about EIA and HIA, right? Environmental impact assessment and health impact assessments. Those things take a long time. There could be lots of delays. And the government in the past had not had a good reputation of keeping its promises. And therefore, a lot of skepticism from communities, uh, from NGOs. Second, ironically, um, the projects are supposed to create something like 1.6 million jobs but Thailand's unemployment rate is 0.7%, which translates to about 300,000 people unemployed. Uh, Kun Khan mentioned about the, the labor shortage and the need for mobility of labor. I agree with him wholeheartedly on this one. Somehow, um, the constraint might actually be labor. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, another constraint, I guess it would be basically, would there be concerns about corruption, would there be corruption, and so on. Um, hopefully, on this count, uh, we seem to have a lot of foreign interest. As I understand it, the Chinese and the Japanese are going to be competing fiercely. The Koreans have shown a great interest, and the Germans as well. I guess with the right policy and the right transparency, you can get a good deal under the current circumstances. So uh, that's in regards to my view on the Thai economy going forward. Again, as I mentioned, exports and investment uh, in infrastructure could be the thing that sustains uh, growth going forward. <clears throat> then, uh, do I have concerns? Are there other issues that we should talk about? Um, I list four things. Number one is, of course, monetary policy in the BART. Um, I think that uh, it is a major challenge for Thailand um, under what is called inflation targeting policy. I think inflation targeting uh, monetary policy is misnamed right? because every monetary policy does target inflation. We all, all central bankers, want low inflation. So every means of achieving low inflation um, is something that we will strive for. What inflation targeting means is that if you think inflation will be high, you will raise interest rates. And if you think inflation will be low and GDP growth will be low, you will lower interest rates. So the key thing is the um, adjustment of interest rate in a timely manner to affect inflationary expectations. Right? That's the key. My question for Thailand is this. Under a global situation where the G4 countries, the US, Europeans, the Japanese, and the, the, um, and the British, are all pushing for bot rock bottom interest rates, near zero interest rates, and printing money, doing quantitative easing. Under this global scenario that will last for another two years, can Thailand independently set its own interest rate? Um, as we learn in, um, in the, uh, basic economics, right, a small open economy like Thailand is a price taker we take the world price as given to us because we can't influence the world price. Can it be said the same about Thai interest rates? If it is, then inflation targeting 
will be a huge challenge because it will set Thailand up for a massive inflow of capital, short-term hot money, that will push the interest rate, to push um, the b a r up. The currency will adjust if you won't adjust interest rate. Again, the currency will adjust if you don't adjust interest rate. And therefore, you could have a situation where, given uh, Mr. Ben Bernanke's promise for another two years of QE and printing one trillion dollars um, a year for the next two years, you could have tons of money coming in, pushing the baht up. Merrill Lynch is, for, for example, forecasting that baht goes to 28 baht to the dollar by the end of this year. I'm pretty sure in Thailand, 29.5, and the exporters will be up in arms. That's a challenge for Thailand on monetary policy. Um, nice to say we want to be independent, but can we, a small open economy, be independent? Be able to independently set monetary policy. That's something that I think Thai uh, economists, academics, have not addressed. They should, right? Um, second is um, fiscal policy. I think Kun Kwan makes very val valid points, and to me, the rice program uh, is a major concern. Um, it seems to me that it, the cost will keep on rising. I don't think, uh, unfortunately, that the, the, the cost will be, you know, 100 billion baht per year or 150. It might very well keep on going up per year because you are encouraging the market. To the producers to overproduce every year, right? Unlike, um, and uh, it uh, it amuses me when um, we thought we could do an OREC instead of an OPEC, right? Um, the difference between rice and oil is that oil, if you don't, if you push up the price uh, to a high level, you can control supply by not pumping it out, but with rice. The farm will produce another, another batch every 100 days, and you'd end up misallocating resources, and you'll be having people in the provinces actually building a lot of these stockades, right, to to put in the rice, which will spoil within two years anyway. So the cost will unfortunately keep on multiplying. It seems to me. Um, not only that, but I think a few people have not thought about this issue. Think about it. Um, we've had fairly good uh, commodity prices. Thailand has done well with rubber. The price of rubber has gone up quite a lot. The government now has come in and said, "Look, we will push the price of rice at a very high level." Now, what does that mean? It actually means that the price of land will go up to a multiple level of the increase in the price of rice, right? Because land, you would calculate it as a Discount cash flow of future earnings of the land. So, if the price of rice goes up 30 percent, the price of land could go up 100 and 200 percent because you do a discount cash flow. The cash flow, the the um, returns go up, and the discount rate is also low because interest rates are low. That is why, in my view, we are going to have quite a boom in the in the provinces because there is a wealth effect. Happening as well. Now, unfortunately, um, this wealth effect has to keep on going up to sustain. If it flattens out, some over leverage people will suddenly have problems, right? As Kun Gon knows, um, once you start to leverage, you have to keep on leveraging more to get um, even better returns. Uh, to me, that's a danger. You you um, could very well see bubbles forming in in certain areas. Um, in terms of overall fiscal sustainability. Um, I would say this. I have to admit that the government's debt level at the moment is low, right? When we talk about 44 uh, debt to GDP, you actually, to be fair, take have to take out the government guarantees on debt of state enterprises that will not lose money. So the debt burden is low. That's why the government seem confident in try in building in in spending more, um, and it's um, putting themselves in a Vulnerable position in the sense that certain things they're doing, they're permanently foregoing revenue, like cutting corporate income tax, or permanently increasing spending, um, like increasing the um, wage 15,000 baht per month for civil servants. 
those things are hard to correct, right? Because you're structurally uh, reducing your ability to um, to uh, reduce the deficit structurally. Right? It's not a one time. I'm less concerned about the car buyers program. So one time we'll, we'll cost them 80 billion baht, but after that they know they won't do it again for a long time. But the uh, other things are here to stay. Right? Um, However, um, the good news would be that if you look at past record of debt sustainability globally, the most important factor about debt sustainability would be GDP growth. Right? In Thailand, if GDP in real terms were to grow less than 3%, I will predict uh, a huge problem on the fiscal front. On the other hand, if GDP were to grow 5%, things would be fine. Right? So to me, it seems to me the biggest thing that, uh, that that sustainability is sensitive to is GDP growth. If you go back in history, you will actually also see that no government actually repay debt. No government repay debt. Debt to GDP falls because GDP rises faster than debt. Okay, debt to GDP falls because GDP rises. And so the government is taking a gamble here. They hope that they can make GDP grow 5% a year in real terms over the next 10 years, then they won't have a problem. The, the other issue, the other uh, important variable is, of course, interest rates. Under current low interest rate looks good, but if it goes back up, obviously interest rate will be key. The third thing is, of course, the size of the debt itself. If it's small, um, as it is right now, not a problem. And then the fourth, of course, is the size of the deficit. So ironically, as I ranked it, the least important is the deficit on a year-on-year -year basis. The most important thing is, does this government spend the money in a worthwhile manner to get GDP growth out in a sustained way? Right. I'll leave it at that. Um, the uh, third, the um, other issue that I'd like to address um, are the ones that are unaddressed, and the three things. Of course, number one, energy. Thailand overly dependent on gas. Um, gas running out, we're not talking about what we're going to do. If we want to do go nuclear, chances are we wouldn't even start within another 20 years. Um, so what do we do? Um, there was hope maybe we could get gas from Burma, but of course Burma will be using its own gas. There's hope maybe we could gas get gas from the JDA with Cambodia, but if we have a problem with Cambodia on the Prawihan issue, that looks to be quite far off. Education, again, um, to me it seems that we have a problem of um, wanting to industrialize without having the educated workforce to industrialize with. And that's something that, you know, um, I can't remember now the number of education ministers we have in the past 10 years, but I would argue about 10 for the past 10 years. Um, finally, um, what I call, what is called SFIs the state-owned um, financial institutions. That is always off the radar screen for most people. These are the government-owned banks, government savings bank, government housing bank, a bank for agriculture, and so on. People didn't realize it, but these have grown from about 6% of the system back in 1996 to 30% now. The government savings bank is now bigger bank than Bangkok Bank. And it is growing fast, and it is becoming uh, very important, and it is less transparent, and it is subject to less stringent um, macro prudential rules uh, because it is under the government rather than under the Bank of Thailand supervision. Um, to me, I guess the biggest potential risk is the SFIs getting into trouble. Again, if they are 30% of the financial system or about 30 some percent of GDP, and the government has to guarantee the deposit of the whole thing, because it does, one way or the other, directly or indirectly. Government tax revenue is only 18% of GDP. Right? So you can't have SFIs having too many bad loads. Uh, let me stop here, thank you. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been listening patiently for the past two hours. I can be very short. In one word, Thailand does not have a foreign policy, period. 
you have such a beautiful government, you know, the biggest achievement, uh, 20 foreign country visits and some top dogs come to Bangkok. That's it. I think uh, Ajahn Charan forget to mention a few biggest achievements. Number one is the passport to Thaksin that give him the full power to move Thai foreign policy abroad. So as you know, the focus of attention is not inside Thailand, it's toward one person. Secondly, just to remind you that actually there are other achievements. I just point out before I deconstruct all your whole argument if we have time. Second point that actually uh, Thai government has done a pretty good job all Rohingyas. You know, six months uh, stay here doing cheap labor. You know, actually this is very interesting because the during uh, thorn times, the, the Thai security forces uh, has done a good job well at pushing, preventing uh, this potential refugee from coming ashore. And those who come ashore, of course, has been sent out uh, via land. But now the situation is different. The, it has become a rather human trafficking, as you can see. Now they're going to the south, these Rohingyas. As you know, uh, our two economists have talked about labor shortage. 300 bucks a day, that's very expensive, 40% uh, rise. So Rohingyas now at the moment is 80 bucks per day in factories in Songkhla uh, down south. So that is another uh, factor that increase uh, the number in the past two years. But I like the government decisions that at least, you know, give them six months, uh, temporarily stay, because we fear that uh, the world will condemn us. I think uh, uh, our basic government uh, in the early days was condemned strongly by the international community due to the push off of this. So I think Thailand will have to pay the consequence. I think from now on, uh, Lohinia labors, we have about 35,000. Uh, Malaysia have about 55,000. That is the official record. Uh, from now on, you will see more uh, labor resulting from this current policy down south, uh, making love of uh, Lohinia because of the 300 baht rise. I think uh, that's the downside. So the third one, if you forgot, to remind you, the government has done a good job in raising the campaign of AEC. You know, we are all crazy about it after billions of baht spent. It's good. You know, raise the awareness and understanding of AEC. But mind you, AEC is not uh, ASEAN community. ASEAN community has other aspects as well. I think uh, this government sort of fear that you know we could not catch up with the neighboring country so the whole notion of AEC is that we'll compete with others instead of AEC helping promote the collective bargaining power of all ASEAN countries now we are setting up you know oh how can we fight with others you know the Laos the Burmese the, the Malaysians and all that practice English and all that you know so that's the good things and all the campaigns uh, that the government tried but uh, I would uh, second that uh, it didn't do much work because by the time the ASEAN community arrived in 2015 the Thai being a good Thai you know we we'll forgot uh, we'll forget all about it because it's late assignment and the money is not there actually the government has already trimmed down a lot of budget after all this spending you know even Opato, Opato, the district officer you mentioned AEC two things you will get Oh, you pretty globalized this day, you know, over job, you know AEC. And then what follow, you will get extra budget to do seminars. So even over job, you know, near the borders of Laos, Malaysia, Cambodia, are talking about AEC. But nobody, what the hell is AEC, by the way, you know, so, but it's good, AEC, keep in mind a AEC. I can give you some more example what the government uh, has done pretty good. One thing, I will mention one more. The ASEAN lanes, you know, after years and years, last December, this government, uh, I mean, 
immigration started asking lanes at Suwanapum Airport. And yesterday, uh, I happened to ask the immigration office, she's a lady, I said, that, uh, did you have a lot of asking traveler uh, went through uh, your counter? She said, very few, most of them are from Taiwan. <laughs> you know why? Because uh, the advertising in front of the uh, immigration is so fussy, you know, it's so colorful, you don't know whether it's an advertising or it's a real one, you know, because it's full of flags, you know, and then you say have Samsung, you have, uh, you know, Champu, you know, so, so they don't know is this for ASEAN lane or something, so the government need to uh, raise public uh, uh, knowledge about this, particularly I think embassy around the world, you know, should know that. If you are ASEAN nationals, you come to Thailand, there are special lanes for you. We did that in 1995, but at that time, there are more Italians uh, went through that uh, <laughs> uh, counter. Having said that, I think uh, I have three points to make uh, uh, on the foreign policy, less uh, foreign policy. If you want to take uh, Dr. Charan's, uh, Peter Charan's words, because Exactly, he convinced me we don't need a foreign policy. In fact, Dr. Titinan, I think, was too generous. I mean, I didn't see anything, but this year will be decisive year, will be very pivotal, because Thailand, I think, is now suffering from uh, so-called uh, Karapakos syndrome, you know? We are alone out there thinking that we are unique. But it's not, the landscape of Southeast Asia has changed. There is a new Southeast Asia out there, which Thailand has never witnessed before for the past 65 years. Myanmar, Burma now has taken drastic reform in the most incredible way. Of course, uh, the jury is still out whether this can be sustainable. Other neighboring countries are competing uh, with Thailand. They have a vibrant uh, workforce. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gorn just mentioned that uh, Thailand has become a, a very great society, correct? I mean, uh, for example, Vietnam, a uh, country like Myanmar, most of the people are young, they, they're really uh, uh, pretty, pretty hopeful. And this environment has already, has no impact on Thailand. Look at the leaders. Look at uh, what Dr. Charan has told us. It's politics as usual, just delay tactics. But the world is not waiting for you. Myanmar is moving fast. So let's look at three issues that will decide whether this government will stay on or not. I'm not quite optimistic because I think Khao Pavi here tempo will cause a lot of trouble, no matter what the decision because it will be politicized by any group that want to stir up trouble. Already you have seen this trend. Whether by uh, whoever, you know, I don't want to mention group because I think they're just pain stupid, uh, trying to undermine the decision, whatever, also the Thai positions uh, ahead of the ICJ uh, decision, I think that is uh, uh, pretty bad. And I think the government also has made a very bad mistake by beginning the media campaign, which very good intention, try to educate the people and prepare them for whatever the consequence. But as it's turned out, well, thanks to uh, the foreign minister, uh, he came out and said that, hey, guys, you know, if we lose, you know, don't blame us, you know, it was the previous government. I think that was the dumbest things, you know, that one can say. I mean, come on, we have to be nonpartisan. I know it's difficult, but dealing at this time, you know, can the leaders of opposition, the leaders of the government be a little bit mindful of what they have to say? But again, you know, Thailand is Thailand, and I think... Uh, we will have problems with Pravi here, no matter what the, the, the decision, because 
uh, there's a lot of uh, factors. Uh, the other day, is, uh, I was shocked actually uh, that I heard uh, Army Chief General Payut said that we will negotiate, you know, trying to find truthful settlement and we will use force as last resort. My goodness, you know, I am a Thai. I understand in our mentality, it's translate into, but don't quote me, if we don't get what we want, we use force. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's the most dangerous. Number two, just to answer uh, uh, Dr. Titinan's point, that is uh, Thailand relation with ASEAN is very important. Last year, Thailand contribution to ASEAN is, well, zero, and it will continue to be so unless there is a substantial progress on the Thai role as a coordinator of ASEAN-China. That is the only redemption. This is why Thailand is working real hard, using its 3,000 years old relation, try to convince China, hey, listen, guy, the time has come for you to back down a bit, you know? Please, you know, we are good friends. I don't know whether we can do that kind of convincing. But I think uh, come April, definitely Thailand as chair of the, I mean, coordinating country of ASEAN China would be able to say something positive, some progress. I think uh, some new ideas uh, has been discussed informally, for example, uh, there could be an idea to set up the so-called 10 plus 1 wise man group. Not, I don't think they're going to use eminent person group because EPG is a loaded term, you know. Marty Natalika, our Indonesian foreign minister, said that uh, he hate this EPG, you know. It sounds like gasoline or something. <laughs> so it will uh, comprise the representative from 10 plus 1 country so that they can work on whatever agree elements which in the past was agreed by ASEAN first. So this could break the deadlock currently. I think if Thailand can push this ahead, then I think uh, Thailand contribution to ASEAN would be great. I am agree with Dr. Titinan that we have a very good, uh, able a permanent say. And in fact, that's actually the biggest problem because he can do only certain things, said only certain things because there is no leadership in the foreign ministry. The leadership is overseas. And that is the most dangerous. So he has all kinds of illusion, you know, placing a uh, wrong ambassador to wrong country all the time. You look at the list uh, this day, Jaran probably will agree with me, you know. Loyalty is more important than meritocracy. You are nodding your head. I, I hope that you agree with me. <laughs> so Thailand contribution to ASEAN will be great in another area on the ASEAN's connectivities. I'm, I'm pretty happy that uh, this government has taken up ASEAN connectivity without giving due credit to the previous government. Even though the previous government, you know, during the 18 months of chairmanship, you know, met all sorts of trouble, postponements, you know, leader participating, it's supposed to ASEAN summit trying to uh, uh, board the helicopter, so on and so on. Still, Amazingly, ASEAN Connectivity Master Plan pushed through. And this government, amazingly, did not have the audacity to recognize, try to avoid, you know, did not want to use ASEAN Connectivities and all that, you know, in the main policy. But now it's very clear that the government has taken up some of the good work that has been done, you know, so it's good. But the government still lack clear idea how to do it. And I don't want to go into detail because uh, we take up the time. I think Tawoy Seaport will take forever to succeed because it was wrong approach. It was started out as a uh, private, and now uh, the government has taken, has set up the 
six committee try to do various things, you know, including uh, a covenant which is good, but I think uh, it will not go very far because uh, funders, potential funder like Japan and other international community, including Burma, they already have their own uh, priority projects. Tivala Seaport uh, is the main one that they want to do, but fine. If this project, the YDC port, uh, which was initiated actually by Kin Yun and uh, Taksin 2003, you want to take it, go ahead, you know. Thailand has a lot of money. Two trillion is waiting on the pipeline, go ahead. So I think um, that is the, the plan. So the government uh, has all the good ideas, including high-speed uh, train, uh, which I think, uh, well, by the next six years, you probably uh, can travel uh, Bangkok, Nong Kai, and then go to, go to Yunnan and the rest of China uh, within six or uh, uh, seven hours. But I don't know uh, uh, what uh, consequence it will have on, on the country. So I think now the high-speed train is a very good instrument uh, for economics and expansions and also increase the uh, dependencies. On the other areas on major powers, there were great excitement over the past few months, particularly over the visits of uh, Obama and of course uh, Chinese leader Hu Jintao, which came uh, to Thailand almost at the same time, uh, giving the impressions, the importance of Thailand. But I was the only one who was not convinced because Thailand was unable to build the block from whatever the Americans and Chinese leader want Thailand to do. So I think it's a missed opportunity. And I think these actually should be the priorities of the Thai government under Ying Rak to revise, revitalize Thailand foreign policy so that it can play the role of the facilitator or middleman or the land bridge between the major powers. This major power is not only the US or China, now you have a situation where ASEAN giants like China, Japan are head to head over the dispute territorial claims. South Korea, another economics uh, giant also uh, has similar problems. So Thailand need a very wise foreign policy, not a personal interested and personal alone that led the Thai foreign policy during the year 2000, 2006. Unfortunately, Thai foreign policy was led by one person that, of course, Thaksin. It has produced some uh, extravagances, you know, specter, you know, like uh, ASEAN Dialogue Corporation which is now uh, in ICU. And there are other ideas, but without the basic foundation of a good foreign policy that is uh, consistency and continuity, Thailand will never be able to take advantage of what gone and uh, our friends describe the economic strength because political stability must be coupling with wise diplomacy. It seems to me that country like Cambodia, country like Myanmar have scored excellently. I mean, they all get A plus, you know. Thailand, I would give is a C minus. Really, C minus is too generous because uh, we depends on our photogenic uh, leaders. I mean, uh, 
Oh, I said it all, you know, she, she's really great because she walked into the meeting in ASEAN Summit, nobody get nervous, you know, everybody feel at ease. I mean, that's great. And in fact, I expect that if she dare, you know, at the summit, coming the summit, if she can make an outrageous plan involving Thailand leadership in ASEAN, if she dare, everybody will agree. Because they will claim Thai, uh, because you know, after all this year, Thailand has never raised any objection. Every things has been according to the script, or oh, not exactly to the script, because sometimes she overdid it on uh, with her way. So, having said that, Thai foreign policy under this government is not very clear. As you see, uh, as I point out. On Rohingya, it looks good. In fact, I would urge the government to accede to 1951 Refugee Convention if we all along want to this to be this kind of humanitarian uh, reason. We should do so. But being a Thai and decisive, non-decisive. I'm sorry. On foreign policy, we will continue to face this. Dilemma as we go along, and as I said earlier, the Thai-Cambodian conflicts will be a major problems, and that will cause and related to other Thai foreign policy problems because Thai-Cambodian problems has all the elements of sitcom. You have a local group, outer nationalist group, outer uh, militaristic group, outer everything, and then you have uh, a very important site, and then across the border you have a very colorful prime minister who has experience with at least 20 Thai prime minister. You know, we have that uh, quick change. So he know exactly when to push. You know the trouble is when our leaders start to quote Hun Sen comment in a cabinet meeting. I would end here. <laughs>